Uh, first, I'll talk about the Android NDK. That's uh, the toolkit from Google that allows you to integrate C and C++ code into Android apps. So one of the core principles it relies on is the JNI, the Java Native Interface. And I'll talk about, of course, the IDEs, so Android Studio uh, and other IDEs. If you're using Unity, you really don't care about this part, but still. And in the end, if we have got some time, uh, we'll go for a Q&A. Otherwise, I'm available for until 1 p.m., actually. Uh, I, I can't stay for the whole day. Anyway, so the NDK is a big toolkit you can get from Google. Um, it was usually available from the NDK um, developer documentation. You can also now download it from Android Studio directly, since our recent releases. When you use the NDK, everything relies on the Java native interface. So the Java native interface is the pr are the principles that allows you to mix Java and C and C++ code. Because Android is a Java world. I hope you already know that. And to communicate with the C and C++ parts, you need specific components. And everything is def defined for the Java native interface. That's not something new introduced with Android. That's something classic on Java environments. So if you did some Java servers maybe 10 years ago, uh, Java native interface was already something you could use before, and nothing has changed. So the interface, uh, on the Java side, it provides you several components you will use. So first, system.load library. That will allow you to load a binary from a Java program. And then the native keyword. So you put the native keyword in front of any Java method. It will be declared as native. And that means that is imp its implementation will be from a native binary. You will have loaded from using system.load library. So on the C and C++ side, to be able to provide the C and C++ implementation to the Java, you have several things. First of all, the GNI header, so GNI.h, that gives you Java primitive types, so a Java integer, a Java object, a Java string, and so on. And specific Java components, so the GNI environment and the Java virtual machines. These are both objects you will use to be able to create Java objects from C and C++, call uh, Java methods from C and C++ and so on. So you need to use these a lot. It's really ugly as hell and not always easy, but that's what you need to use to provide your implementation, implementation to Java. So to provide your C and C++ implementations to Java, you need to use return manipulate Java objects. So for this, you use the JNI environment I described before. You can do an automatic mapping, so from your C and C++ implementations inside your .so files and the Java method that has been declared native by using a convention. So this convention is as such. So you start with Java, then uh, underscore, then the package name, then the name of a the class, then finally the method that has been declared as native. So if you have such prototype in your uh, .c files, it will be automatically mapped to the Java implementation when the .so file is loaded. You can, if you really don't like that name, and I would totally understand that, <laughs> you can use your own conventions, but and later manually call register natives on GNI env. So all what you manipulate are Java objects and Java primitive types. So here are all those that are available. So actually, everything objects inherits from a J object, and um, that's a reference to a Java object. So you don't directly manipulate the memory of a Java object. So many things could go wrong if you were uh, doing that. And all the primitive types are on the right. So of course, you need to reinvent a Boolean again, uh, because on Java, uh, everything has a fixed size. And in C and C++, it varies uh, across platforms. So you need to have objects that are always the same size, whatever it's running on 32 or 64-bit platforms. So let me come back to the, the question also first. Why should you use C and C++ on Android? and uh, why going uh, through this painful process, <laughs> I'd say. Um, you have many reasons. First of all, if you want to write a really cross-platform game engine or game um, in OpenGL, yes, 
then C++ is quite an obvious choice because you can compile it for all the platforms, minus some differences between platforms, like, as always, when you try to do cross-platform code. Uh, you have really good libraries you may want to reuse. So you have tons of reasons. But when you add Android to your list of targets for your code, you need to take into consideration that Android is Android. So it's uh, not exactly standard and compliant with all the other systems you, you used before. So for your C and C++ code, you need to know it's using Bionic C library and not it's not compatible with uh, standard Genius uh, C library. So it's you have some things that are missing, like pthread close and um, um, some of our processes. But you also gain access to specific Android system properties. So you have specific NDK APIs you can use. For example, to replace shell memory segments, you have uh, another system for on Android. But yeah, that prevents you to write really cross-platform code sometimes. So you need to write platform-specific code. And in general, but not you need to cross-compile uh, your code, so to generate .so files for Android. And for all the Android uh, architectures it's that are supported by the NDK. And right now there are seven of them. So the NDK makes it easy. You just call NDKables and it will generate your .so files for all the uh, architectures. It's better to use the NDK for this instead of trying to have uh, all the tool chains to generate yourself the .so file. Um, because many things can go wrong and are not documented. That was for C. Uh, if you're doing some C++, by default, nothing is supported but objects. <laughs> um, but already included in the NDK and the platforms, you can switch the C++ runtime to something that uh, provides more functionalities. For example, by default, you may think you don't even have the STD and uh, not even support for templates or exceptions or runtime type inspections. But you can switch the standard system C library to another, so here's the list. So JBL, STL, PORT, GNU, STL, or uh, libc++, with different set of features. You could ask why the L, uh, like five different C++ runtimes. The answer here is simple. These are, uh, they have different supports. So if you're looking for uh, STD Chrono, it's not available in all the different C++ runtimes. Some of these runtimes are on GPL version 2, some of ours aren't. Um, so for each uh, case, you, for your code, you need to ask yourself which one you want to use. And also, if you're using a C++ runtime, you have to use the same for all your applications. So you can't have different C++ runtimes uh, living in the same process. And you can specify which runtime you want, and if you want to use the shared or sta static version. And also when using uh, features like uh, exceptions and RTTI, you also need to specify that you're going to use these features for the local CPP features um, viable. <coughs> anyway, I know it's maybe a lot of information, um, but to make it more clear, so you saw there are some C and C++ sources. Uh, there are Java methods that are declared native. So here's how it works uh, at execution time. So in your code, system.library is called to load a .so file that contains all the binary implementations of your C++ code. And when you call system.library, the mapping is done between your native implementations and the Java headers. And later, during the execution of your code, so usually you do the system.load library in a static block of a Java class. So it's, uh, it happens when the class is first loaded. And then later, when a native method is encountered, so native on the Java side, the virtual machine will execute the C and C++ implementation that has been mapped. So there is no, not a, a new thread or whatever is happening. It's just the virtual machine that will execute your code when it encounters a native method. So you don't go outside of any sandbox. You can't bypass permissions or do whatever crazy stuff you wanted to do. 
And then once the implementation has been executed, it goes back to Java again, and it's quite seamless. There is one exception. Uh, um, it's a classic execution flow. There is a quite common um, method of doing C and C++ on Android. It's when you use native activity and native activity.h. So these are helpers from the SDK, from the Android SDK, that allows you to create an Android application without even a single line of Java. Because native activity.h uh, will take care himself of creating an activity, so an Android window, instantiating um, an EGL view and giving you an OpenGL surface and processing, giving you a thread to process inputs, everything. So in that case, you don't have to do call system.library yourself or, uh, or have mapping between Java and C++ methods because everything is taken care of by the native activity. And you can just reuse the surface and um, do your own C and C++ inside native activity. But it's still important to understand all the Java native interface because even if you have the native activity and do almost only C and C++, you need to integrate the with the Android system and it's a Java world. So you, you'll have to use the GNI from your C and C++ to call methods that are only available in Java. Because the NDK world is really separated from uh, the Java API. So the Java API are not, uh, they don't exist also as under the form of NDK APIs. So let's talk about the ID. So Android Studio, uh, who is using Android Studio in the room? Okay. Still, many people. So, at last Google I.O., yeah, end of May, they announced um, the integration of JetBrains C Lion, so a C and C++ editor from JetBrains, which is really great. So, they announced it end of May, and uh, everyone's been waiting for it. <laughs> and it only has been released in July. And everything is quite alpha, experimental, and uh, all that stuff still as of now. Before, with Eclipse, the NDK was quite supported. Uh, and now, Eclipse support for Android... I mean, the Android support for Eclipse is quite uh, dead, and uh, everyone should switch to Android Studio. And uh, But Android Studio, for C and C++, everything is a bit experimental. So it's not the best time to start writing C and C++ code for Android. So many things are still undocumented, and uh, some changes are happening like every new releases. But the support is great uh, already when it works. Um, you have auto-completion, you have automatic mapping uh, of um, Java methods. So see here, you just create a, a Java method, you uh, put the native keyword and path, you auto-complete, and it creates the right uh, prototype into a new C file, and you've got your NDK module. The only thing that remains is you need to call system.loadlibrary on the library that uh, will have been generated. But uh, it's really a lot. And then all the C++ support from CLion is quite great. I mean, you've got refactoring. Um, uh, you get also uh, static inspection. So you get many, many good things from the ID. So that made me switch from the IM, definitely. When you configure an NDK module inside uh, Android Studio, so all the configurations are supposed to happen uh, inside the build.gradle files. So here's an android.ndk block. So you see the module name is the final name of the .so file that will be generated, the one you will call using system.load library. So here I call it logni. So it will generate .so files name named lib logni.so. And when you call system.loadlibrary, I think I've added it here, yeah, you reuse the same name. So you forget the lib prefix and the .so extension. You just call system.loadlibrary hello GNI. So here's a full picture, by the way, of uh, what's happening. So when you integrate some C and C++ code. Here you see on the top the uh, native implementation. So I'm including the GNI header. Here I'm returning a J string, a Java string, and here you see the ugliest uh, name in the world. So to define um, the native method that will be automatically mapped 
to a uh, string from GNI. So you see it starts with Java, then the package name, then the name of a class, hello GNI, then the name of the method, string from GNI. Since I'm returning a Java string, I am not returning uh, a C string. Uh, that's quite obvious, but <laughs> many people would like it to be auto automated. So I need to create a Java string. So for this, I use the GNI environment that is always passed as first argument of any method that is called from the Java virtual machine. And on this environment, I call new string UTF. Here it's in C, uh, not in C++. So you can see I'm passing the end back um, <coughs> when I call the method, but in C++, you can just remove this argument. It's not needed. So I'm asking the Java virtual machine to create a new string that contains hello from GNI. The hello from GNI part is a C string at this time, and it will create so, uh, this Java string and return a reference to the Java virtual machine. And since it's a Java object, um, it will be taken care of by garbage collection and uh, all that stuff. Use case for the NDK. Um, you just have one module with one implementation in C++ that is mapped to one method in Java. But of course, you can go further and uh, having the native activity I have mentioned. So it's one sample from the NDK. Um, I can recommend you to have a look at it. It's called Teapot, as usual for many demos. So it's directly giving you a, a drawing engine. Um, so here you have uh, the methods, the sources. So the goal is to render a Teapot. I think you, <laughs> you already got that. And what you get is drawing engine. Um, and you can you can uh, start from this sample and uh, integrate it with already existing OpenGLES code, for example. And here it's just classic OpenGLES code. So you see all the auto completion and uh, everything is working uh, directly from the ID. And you also have debugging support from the ID. So these were all the development steps. Now when we are integrating C and C++ code into an Android application, uh, it's really important to think about uh, publication because you're integrating binary stuff. And in the end, you, your app needs to run on many devices that may have different platforms. So of course, the major platform, right now it's Army ABI v7a. But you also find x86, x86-64, ARM64, V8A. So all these platforms need to be supported from your binaries. So when you, are, you have uh, previous configuration, so NDK module, uh, define your bot.gradle, and so on, you compile. And the ID will generate .so files inside um, so one .so file per architecture. So here you see ARM64, ARM ABI, and so on. There are seven of them right now. And inside the final IPK, this will be integrated under the folder named lib and subfolders named against all the ABIs. At installation time, your device will choose the folder that it prefers among uh, the ones that are available and uh, use only the libs that are inside its folder. And if you have big .so files that contains assets or whatsoever, you can also have one IPK per architecture. That's also possible on Android. To do this, uh, you need to switch to advanced mode in the Google Play Developer Console and send all your IPKs with different .so files subfolders and different version codes. Because the Play Store uh, is relying only on uh, version code systems, so here you can see I've uploaded two APKs to the, my Google Play Developer Console. If you can see behind the pixels. So with different uh, native platforms, because for, the, for one, I kept only the x86 subfolder, and for the other one, I kept only the ARM EIBI subfolder. And you can see a summary of their version codes. 
So, and again, the warning is put here because, and it explains you what is important, is some devices may run multiple APKs. So all the x86 Android devices, in fact, they can run ARM code because you have runtime translation. So the device will always receive the APK with the IR version code, whatever the native platform is, if it's supported. So you need to give the IOS version code to the x86 platforms. And the other case, I mean, ARM ABI devices running x86 code don't exist as of now. So yeah, keep this rule, IR version code for x86 platform. So back to uh, what you can configure when you're using the NDK. So you saw uh, earlier from the build Gradle file, uh, you could of course, uh, change the module name, so the name of your .dotx file. You can also specify the toolchain and its version. So in uh, Android NDK, you can, uh, by default, it's uh, GCC 4.8 for 32-bit platforms and 4.9 for s 64 bit platforms. Um, you can also switch compiler and so on. Important too, you can set uh, specify CPU flags, um, LD flags and uh, libs and ABI filters, if you want to support only a specific set of platforms, you can put this here, and STL, so the C++ runtime uh, of your choice. Honestly, it's not enough yet. Uh, well for some projects, you may want to have more. So they are supported by some, some parts, but not fully yet. Uh, so for the future, you may expect to have dark, dark support for include directories and so on. Right now, you can specify include directories by uh, tuning the C flags. I think I've, uh, I've got an example for this. At least in the teapot sample, uh, you can look at how they did, for example. So yeah, it's not pretty, but uh, it works. <laughs> So that's how you can specify more include directories uh, by using the CPP flags. Um, sometimes when you work with the NDK, you may have libraries such as OpenCV or, or whatsoever that are already pre-compiled, so on the form of .a or .s files. Right now, it's not well supported by um, Gradle. It should be supported in upcoming versions. Right now, you can do it, finally, uh, with some hacky way. So right now, if you need to rely on uh, pre-built, so already existing .so files or .a files, what I would recommend is to deactivate all the Gradle configuration and instead use the former way to use the NDK with Eclipse, but you're not forced to use Eclipse uh, at all. It's to directly call NDK build script yourself and use make files. So with the Android NDK, uh, you can use not so regular make files, but Android NDK make files called android.mk and application.mk. Uh, if you want to do that, you can just deactivate. So from your build.cradle, you can tell the system not to look at your GNI sources and to integrate .so files from the libs folder. So when you use NDK build from the, uh, the NDK, all your .so files will be generated inside uh, libs, the libs folder. So you can just tell Gradle to integrate your .so files while ignoring your sources, not try to recompile anything. This way you have the IDE and even debugging that are working, and you can fully configure uh, your NDK modules. So here is the shortest uh, possible android.mk file that defines uh, your NDK module, its sources, and to create a .so file. So local module here you see again. So here it's still hello GNI. Now you need to specify your sources, like in make usual make files, and to include the macro that tells the NDK to build to build a .so file. And from there you can configure a lot of things, of course more than what we uh, than what you can do with build.gradle. So I keep all this for reference because we, we don't have uh, as much time as we need. 
But yeah, you can easily configure into directories, um, pre-compiled modules that you rely on, and so on. And the overmake file is called application.mk, and in that one you only configure things, so variables that uh, are for your .so files. So the most important one is the app platform that defines what is the minimum Android uh, API level you need to run against. By default, there is a huge bug in Android Studio and Gradle support that will always choose the highest possible one uh, when you use Android Studio. So you need to at least test uh, your application on earlier devices to see if it's working. Because normally what you do is to set this app platform var variable to the minimum version you want to run against. It's really important here. And then all the other uh, parameters, you can already configure this from Android uh, Studio and Gradle. So the uh, tool chain, um, the platforms you're supporting, the C++ runtime, and so on. Now I said Android Studio, everything is quite experimental, alpha, and uh, you get many releases. You may use other IDs. I mean, if you're using Unity, you don't really care about Android Studio, and uh, it works. It supports all the platforms. What I've said about version codes and .so files integrated in the apps are still, is still true for when you're using Unity, because Unity relies on .so files. But you may want also to use, uh, for example, Visual Studio, so 2015 version, uh, as greatly improved Android support. So now you can create directly a, a native activity, simple as I've described uh, first, and do all your coding and uh, packaging from Visual Studio. It's working great, um, like many Visual Studio targets. And you even have projects that can target both Android and iOS uh, while sharing OpenGL ES code. That's quite great. Um, yeah, so a screenshot from Visual Studio with Android code, that's working well. Now, only one thing is uh, when you use Android Studio, uh, Visual Studio, as usual, you have several targets. Um, you can have ARM target, x86 target. That means it doesn't support having uh, all the Android targets at once. So you need to recompile for each platform. But you need to tune the Russian code accordingly when you uh, target different platforms. And by default, it's not done. <laughs> That's quite a sad story. Uh, luckily, I've just written a... a a file, for, so you just copy and paste it in your project called customrules.xml, and that will adjust the version code depending on your um, CPU target. So this way, you just integrate this file, and you can easily publish your IPK for all the supported platform to the Play Store, and it will work, not complain, and properly be distributed to Android devices.